Morgan, which has been a growth business for us. We launched this back in 2007 to focus on the growing market for impact investing. Um, and we have a really great panel here to talk a little bit more about trends and how people are thinking about doing deals in this space and, and how corporates are also getting more involved. And I thought it's worth sort of taking a step back. I, just, I wanna get a sense, because uh, we come and talk about this topic a lot, but I'm, I'm always curious about how much the audience knows about what we're doing. So how many of you feel very confident that you know what impact investing is? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> and is anyone, think, is anyone doing impact investing today in the audience? Okay, so one or two. So everyone here on stage is doing it. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, how all of these guys are actually trying to implement this within their own organizations. But let me define a little bit about what we're talking about first. So impact investing, if you wanna now take this definition out, you can now represent that you know what it means. It means that you're investing with the intent to create financial return as well as positive social environmental impact. Taking it a step further, it usually implies that you need to be thinking about accountability and success, both as it relates to what you do on the financial side as well as what you do on impact. So it is not enough to earn a high financial return and not create impact and vice versa. You need to try and achieve both and that's how most investors who are active in this space think about doing that. Now we all have different approaches to how we actually try to assess uh, success as it relates to impact and we'll talk a little bit about that here on the panel, but that's what we're talking about definitionally when we, when we refer to impact investing. And this is a strategy that a number of different types of organizations are taking on. Uh, we published a survey, I think it was referenced in the prior, some of the prior discussions at the conference today. We published an annual survey with the Global Impact Investing Network, which is the leading sort of network of larger investors who are participating in this space. Uh, and got responses from 125 impact investors who manage about $46 billion in assets who last year would have committed about $11 billion and expect to put $13 billion, just to give you a sense of the market. So in a $70 trillion asset management universe, that's, this is fairly small, but it has been growing um, over the last several years, and we sort of continue to see that happening. Uh, the organizations that were represented are not surprising. There are a lot of development banks. There are a lot of foundations that are in those numbers. There are also a number of banks like us. There's a number of fund managers. So there's a very diverse set of players that are in place. And I think it's important to note that in surveying these players, they all cited that both impact as well as financial return were really important to their strategies and, in fact, essential to actually being able to deploy capital well. So in I won't purport that this is necessarily representative of the entire market, but it's a large enough sample that we can get very comfortable that these are sort of what the trends that we're seeing in the marketplace. So to talk about that, you know, what's, what keeps a lot of corporates on, on the sidelines, I think, as it comes to this market is what keeps a lot of people from participating. Um, there's not a lot of track record. There's some little clarity around what deal flow is. There's obviously definitional issues in terms of people understanding what it actually means and how to use it. And so I thought, with this panel, we can actually talk about the three organizations here who will help be helping us understand how they're actually implementing these practices. So um, to just provide quick introductions, and I'll kick off the first question and let these guys talk a little bit about what they do. Um, to my left, or on, on the right-hand side of me, if you're looking at the stage, is Dana Pankrazi from the Heron Foundation. FB Heron Foundation is really focused on addressing uh, the needs of, in particular, disadvantaged communities um, around the world and they are unique in that they invest all of their assets for mission. So both their grants, their endowment, and everything in between has to be committed to mission, and, and Dana will talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, and they're investing in all types of different organizations, both nonprofits as well as for-profits and some hybrids as well. Um, sitting next to Dana is Omid Sateh, who's from Prudential. Prudential has been an impact investor since 1976, and they have a pretty unique strategy that's housed within their corporate, so corporate social responsibility unit and combines both investments for Prudential, the company, as well as for their foundation. And he can talk a little bit, a bit more about how they do that, but they've committed more than $1.5 billion to date in transactions and managed today about a $400 million portfolio. And then finally, um, on my far left is Sunil Shah, who's been doing impact investing for a lot of different organizations um, in her career. Today, she's the founding executive director of the Beak Center for uh, social innovation or social impact and innovation at Georgetown University. She's also a senior fellow for the Case Foundation, who's recently started to get involved in impact investing and helping to scale that, and a fellow at the Institute for Politics at Harvard. 
Prior to that, she actually uh, helped found the White House Office of Social Innovation as part as her in her role as Deputy Assistant to the President of the United States, and has done some other interesting sort of development-related and impact investing work at organizations like Google and the Treasury, as well as Goldman Sachs. Um, so that's who you're hearing from today. So I think you'll get a pretty diverse perspective on how people are deploying capital here. But let me kick it off and, and start maybe with, with, uh, with Dana and just talk a little bit more about uh, why these organizations are doing this and get a little bit more background. So Dana, on, in terms of this 100% mission strategy, maybe you can talk a little bit more about what that means in practice for Heron and how you think about um, using the capital markets to achieve some of the programmatic objectives of the organization. Sure. Um, so the Heron Foundation was formed around 20 years ago. And initially, uh, in part because it's what we do often in this country, we were formed with a, um, an endowment, and the presumption was the endowment would invest, and there would be a grant making operation that would give off about 5% a year in grant making. Um, very, very early on in our, in our existence, one of our board members called the question that uh, they were all on the board to have some social impact, and yet we spent two thirds of our time together at the time, quarterly in person meetings, discussing our investment portfolio and the performance of that. And uh, a question was called, which is really our seminal organizing question, which was really shouldn't we be more than a private investment trust which uses some of its excess cash flow for good? That question completely hung a left hand turn in the way we do business and started with us initially building a program related investment practice. So doing below market rate typically, although they don't have to be below market rate, they can be concessionary in a lot of ways. Um, loans, equity positions, and so on. And then over time, we started working um, on our a good day in the market. We're around 300 million. So as far as US foundations go, we're very, very small. Um, but we have made the pledge to commit 100% of the assets in our disposal uh, for mission. So the 300 million all in is for mission at all times. So the way that operationalizes for us is um, we're out in the world kicking up dust, causing trouble, looking for impactful enterprises. Those who are having an impact on low and moderate income people and communities who are striving to help themselves out of poverty. When we source interesting enterprises like that, we have the liberty to underwrite them and really figure out what the need is. Um, is it a grant? Is it a program related investment? Is it debt? Is it equity? Is it market rate? Is it not? Is it something else? And then to deploy that type of capital in order to grow their impact but importantly for us, uh, grow their impact, but not at the expense of the health of the organization. So for us, um, it's really about fundamental style investing. We look at management companies, we look at track records, we look at um, the ability to know what impact an organization is having. And by the way, uh, for me, when I say organization, enterprise, business, um, that's ubiquitous. I could be referring to a nonprofit or a public company. So just to be clear for us, we truly approach the world in a tax status agnostic um, fashion, which is both thrilling and daunting. <laughs> Makes your pipeline quite overwhelming, I would think. <laughs> uh, well, let's come back to because I think there's some, we'll dig in a little bit on the deal side before we come back to the audience or questions. But let me uh, just get a little bit more background as well from the rest of our panelists. Omid, can you talk a little bit, um, I sort of tried to articulate sort of how you all are organized, but I think that's actually a pretty unique setup for the organization and talk a little bit about what got Prudential into this in the first place. Great. Thank you, Amy. Uh, well, was rather loud. Um, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice a bit, so I was surprised by how loud that was. Uh, so one of the things that's interesting about what Prudential does is that we have both our impact investing unit, which I run, as well as our foundation and all of our employee volunteers and programs, all organized under one CSR umbrella. Um, it's relatively unique because not that many corporates have an, a formalized impact investing program, and those that do typically house it with the investment units. And I think. The choice was made, I think, actually as early as the late 70s to house all those functions together um, in part so that they could leverage each other. Uh, having all three under one roof actually works very well because I think we're, you know, I think in the impact investing world, you hear a lot of people, I think, who are evangelical about the promise. I think we're, we're much more subdued because we recognize that there are challenges that only grants can solve. There are, only ch there are challenges that only our employees and their time and energy can address. And then there are challenges that are fundamentally investable challenges. And by having all three together, I think it allows us to stay in our appropriate lanes and actually feed off each other in an incredibly synergistic way. And so we get investment referrals from some of our foundation colleagues. We see incredibly necessary social change from our investment work that we can refer to our 
our foundation colleagues, both of those generate great in, you know, uh, employee engagement opportunities. And so there's a real value to having those three functions together. Um, looking out at the audience, I think there's a lot of non-financial corporates. Um, and so sometimes I think there's a sense, can we do this, should we do this? And at the end of the day, most of the large corporates in this room are sitting on a tremendous amount of cash. Uh, typically, that's cash that's invested with some of the folks in this room, but outside. And these days, that money isn't really earning all that much. Uh, and I think that was sort of the genesis of why I think it was pretty easy, actually, for us to make the internal case to take some of those assets and do something a little bit different. Um, whatever your view of impact investing, whether you think it's revenue neutral, going to lead the world and do better, or slightly less than market rate returns, on the scale of resources it takes to put a significant amount of assets into it is negligible relative to what most of the large corporates are already doing around CSR. So even if you take the most pessimistic case as to how good we are at investing, it's still relatively negligible to all of your CSR budgets and I think can be incorporated within those strategies. Great, thank you. And then Sunil, you have a little bit more of a market view, I think, given some of the work that you're doing today and then what you've seen in, in your course of your career. What, from your perspective, you, so you hear a little bit from how these guys are approaching it, where do you see as sort of barriers to growth or sort of what are some of the, what are the, some of the obstacles from your standpoint? And maybe talk a little bit about some of the work that you're doing actually to try and address that as well. So um, it won't be uh, in, unfamiliar to many of you, but I think and also somewhat uh, Dana, Omid, and uh, Amy, you've already mentioned. You know, the biggest challenge that we see consistently, um, I work at the Case Foundation where I'm a senior fellow, uh, specifically working on scale and impact investing, and then uh, also at, at Georgetown, but here in this case and also on the G8 task force, the challenges that we see are actually definition is a big problem. Um, the fact is some, some people call nonprofits impact investments, some people call hybrids impact investments, and others just want it to be for-profit investments. So, being clear about what we want the definition to be is actually pretty important. And I think the original reason that the tent was created so big was to incorporate everybody in. But I think the tent is too big, and we need to figure out what our definitions are. So making some delineation and definition would actually be very helpful. A lot of players aren't new players are kicking the tires not coming in because they don't know what to define as an impact investment. Um, second, I don't think uh, we have really good clarity as to what returns in the sector actually have been. So by asset class, by uh, issue area, if we actually know what the returns are, and I don't, I think it, sometimes people get scared because if we find out they were below market rate or uh, somewhere above market rate that people might not invest, and what we find is investors are in it for multiple reasons. Some want to help build the market, some want to help grow the market, some want to scale the market, and they're willing to come in at, the, at those different levels if there were actually a way to come in at, and know what the returns might be by asset class. And, and an example here is actually very useful. It's like we were thinking about recycling 20 years ago. It was not an investable class. Today, when you think about recycling, it's a possible investment, investable class, but it took people early off in the marketplace to actually make those investments to make that happen, whether it's with municipalities or what, whether it was local governments, but that actually matters. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, the same example can be used um, for, for uh, organic foods. Yeah. And organic food today seems like the norm, but it wasn't a norm 25 years ago. And somebody had to invest in that market uh, at that time to make that happen. So, so definitions matter. Um, return, as, you know, knowing what the returns are matters. And I think also finding where the investors are. Not everybody's going to care about the environment or climate change. Some people are going to care about food. Some people are going to care about education. Some are going to. So finding where their passions are and where they want to invest and where they're willing to make those investments. Um, and, and then kind of what are the issue areas they really care about. So those are, those are the three that I see are kind of big reasons why the scale isn't happening. But and on the, re on the return point, do you think as well a limitation is not knowing if it, not only will it generate financial return, but will actually doing this funky new impact? thing, will it generate impact, right? Yeah. And how do you generate impact? Who's, whose metric are we using for impact? How do you, if, if I say I used um, metric from Harvard or you used it from Duke, will those count or is somebody going to come back and say those metrics don't matter? So I think, I think the investor class actually needs to pick some metrics and agree to the metrics they're all going to use consistently because without that we're all trying to use 50 new metrics and we yeah. don't know what that is. So both the social and the, and the financial metrics are needed and there's some, need some consistency in that. 
So let's uh, just continuing on with you, if, if you don't mind, just talk a little bit, because so what Case has decided to commit capital to in sort of the impact investing space is really focused on the ecosystem. Yeah. And talk a little bit about how you all are putting capital to work um, and how that should, in theory, help maybe bring down some of these barriers or address some of the issues that you just highlighted. So we're looking at three areas, and I'd say from from all, from where all of you sit, think about both your grant and investment portfolios as working together on some of this, because the ecosystem matters a lot. And the three areas that we're looking at are one, uh, education, just educating. High, we're particularly focused on the high net worth population, educating them on what impact investing is and how they can get started and what are the issues that they should, what are the questions that they may have, but at least making that a consistent set of education tools out there. Um, two, investing in returns mm -hmm. and knowing what the returns are and what the metrics are. So we're actually going to put money into several organizations, um, including B Corp, including um, uh, Gin and others, to think about how to do returns by, understand the returns by asset class. And, and the third is actually stories, right? We don't have, we, there's lots of great organizations that people have invested in. Nobody knows who they are and where they are. So where Duke University and others have been uh, doing research on this stuff, they don't actually invest in how to tell their story effectively. So we're actually giving the communications dollars for them to be able to tell the story as to what are the 12 most impactful funds in the United States that have, done a, that have had returns? Um, what have they done? They've done the research already, but nobody knows about it. Yeah. And my, my bet is majority of the people in this room wouldn't know that there's a study at, on Duke University's website that has 12 investable funds because nobody talks about it. So we will invest in some of the communications aspects too because that's a place where a lot of people don't actually put in, um, put in the capital for that. And uh, those are the three right now we're looking at and as we see where the other gaps are in the marketplace. The last thing we're looking at and we're not, we're not sure where this is going to come out is you know, in the way that there's a LEED certification for if you wanted to invest in green buildings, mm -hmm. um, is to think about whether there might be a LEED type certification in investing in impact. So where you have base level of impact investing, the medium level, the high level, and the platinum level, what could that look like and sure. to make it easier for people to come in on fairly easily. That makes sense. And Dana, someone mentioned sort of the ecosystem and needing to bring together integrating the grant and the investing capital, which obviously is very essential in your strategy and trying to go 100% mission. Talk a little bit about how that integration plays out. And then I'd, I'll, I'll come back as well. I, I'd like to drill down a little bit on the nonprofit point, but maybe let's talk about integration and sort of how you all manage your internal ecosystem. Sure. First of all, it's very much a work in progress. I think you all know there are not good systems yet in our, in our sector. But we, we've taken the point, and I very much appreciate the point about language. Um, in the absence of, of language for the sector, we've taken the point of view that all investing is impact investing, period. Because for years and years, we advocated the notion that there was mission-related investing, there was regular investing, there was mission-related investing, and under mission-related investing, you were either doing it at a market rate or below market rate. That w we advocated that for many, many years. The problem was, when we started with 100% permission mandate, and I promise I'm coming back to the question you asked. Yep. <laughs> when you started with 100%- We'll intervene, <laughs> if not. <laughs> when you start with 100% permission mandate, um, what we started doing was examining every single position we held for what the impact was. And we very quickly figured out every dollar that leads us or that is in our management has impact. The, the reality was we were only calling it impact investment if we really liked the impact it was having. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality. And so we ended up completely changing our language to say, you know what, all investing is impact investing. For us, we now talk about whether a position is examined or unexamined. We examine every position we have. We're working our way through that now. We're about two years into it. Um, and for us, if we've examined it and the impact is acceptable to our mission, then we keep it. If it's, if it's examined and it's unacceptable, then we replace it. And that is how we think about optimizing the impact of our portfolio, um, recognizing that the infrastructure for impact is not perfect. Um, we try to take the approach that we, uh, we have some broad sense, and of course we're better at it in grants and we're worse at it with privately held companies, a little better with publicly held companies. We get the data we can, we try to draw an assessment as to whether or not the impact is consistent with our mission, and then based on that, we move companies back and forth between negative two and positive two on an impact scale, and we're always optimizing. So for a grant, for example, um, for us, 
we absolutely believe that our grants must have both social and financial return. And you're probably saying, what, a grant with a financial return? Well, for us, we're a capital provider. We're very, very clear that we are providing growth, change, or adaptive capital to already strong organizations who have a vision for how they might be different or to have improved revenues in the future. So for us, that's heavily business plan driven, it's heavily financial model driven, and it's heavily capital absorption plan driven. So we model the return on investment. Revenues should be improving over time. Their financial position should be improving over time. Since we're using a grant, we leave it in the organization to allow them to accrue a risk capital position. So they have a little capital to spend on things they think are important. The benefit to us is these relationships tend to be three to five years, they tend to be somewhere between four and $20 million in scope. And at the end of that engagement, they should be, by design, if all has worked out well, and it doesn't always, they should be more sustainable. And for us, that allows us the opportunity to exit without having the frantic, frenetic, who's gonna replace our revenue? Because the whole point of our style of grant making is to build a built capacity that lets us exit and then have a healthier future. Absolutely consistent with the way we treat our private equity portfolio. And so talk a little bit about what it means to invest, meaning not do a grant in a nonprofit. In like a CRI? Yeah. yeah. So it, what does, how, do, how does sort of moving nonprofits to maybe it's a more self-sustaining strategy yeah. rather than being reliant on grants alone, but sort of what, how does an investment look in that type and how do you yeah. use that to sort of push that agenda? Sure. Um, so first of all, we're, uh, we're working with, again, strong organizations that have a track record, that have solid management. Again, the way we think about assessing any company, we're not doing de novo, we're not doing, um, we're not rescuing anybody. So full disclosure. We're working with strong organizations. But for us, um, important point, we are not prescriptive that they rotate from contributed income to earned income. We don't think 100% earned income is the panacea that it has been made out to be over the years. Nonprofits have a tax exempt status for a reason. Contributed income can often be as reliable or in some cases more reliable than earned, uh, say, government contracts. <laughs> we tend to be really unreliable right now. We have a whole cottage industry of bridging government receivables. Um, so we're not prescriptive as to the rotation. We're interested in what they're building that allows reliability in their revenue stream. What we're trying to hedge against is organizations who are marrying fixed expenses, people, infrastructure, buildings with wildly variable revenue. And we're trying to, we're trying to not take on so many fixed expenses and really build reliable revenue. Um, and again, that could be adding the development shop. That sure. could be, um, it could be changing technology. It could be adding people. It might well be rotating to earned income. We're not prescriptive about that, but that's the type of thing we're looking for. Got it. So Amid, Sunil, and, and Dana are talking about sort of their vantage point from a foundation, but you said it a corporate, and I'm curious, this is now going, getting close to a 40-year exercise for you all. What keeps it alive at- it's no longer at, beta. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> what keeps this alive at Prudential and sort of where's growth for you? Where are barriers in terms of the things that you're trying to do? Talk a little bit about sort of how you think about the next several years for the organization. Sure. You know, I think one of the things that makes it so vital and so immediate to Prudential is that if you think about where our company is based, we're primarily based out of Newark and Hartford, which are two relatively struggling cities. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, the vast majority of our employees have to come to work in those markets and confront, you know, however they get there, all sorts of issues of poverty, class, race, and everything else. And so I think the issues have a, re a disproportionate resonance. Uh, there's not that many you know, large corporates that are housed in markets like Newark that are fairly struggling cities. So I think that adds a daily motivation to, to what we do. Uh, if you look at the genesis of the company, it's 140 years old, but it started as a burial insurance company for the working poor. That too, I think, has some role in the sort of the DNA of the company. So it's always been oriented, I think, at some level to some of those working class issues. And then I think at the top level, we have incredible support uh, at our board and senior management. Uh, we, part of how we've been able to get the flexibility within a regulated financial institution to do this work is that we report actually directly to a subcommittee of the board of directors um, four times a year. And so having that level of top level buy-in, I think both sort of puts a lens on the work, but also sort of gives the necessary flexibility to sort of address the new challenges and do some really innovative and risk-taking things. 
Yeah, and I actually, that's true for us as well. I think yeah. the senior management support, we have operating committee sponsorship in order to keep us secure in our own mandate. So I think that's, that's really critical for foundations. So let's talk about the fun stuff, which is the deals, at least for me, <laughs> being a deal person. Um, Amid, I'll, I'll pick on you since we, we uh, got you on this last one, but maybe you could talk a little bit. You guys have done some really interesting things, and I think one approach that's been at least symptomatic of some of the things that you've done is this layered capital and sort of how you think about bringing different actors together. So maybe you can talk about an example in your portfolio sure. of that. So one of the organizations that actually our foundation had supported for quite a while was UNICEF. It's a terrific international organization that does great work and um, the foundation had worked with them on a program sort of in Brazil and some various programs and sort of you know education efforts in the favelas of Brazil. Um, and through that relationship on one side and then Secondarily, we had done some community investing with some colleagues at LISC and Enterprise over the years who eventually moved to UNICEF. Um, we worked very closely with UNICEF to set up something called the Revolving Bridge Fund. Uh, and UNICEF is the classic nonprofit that has terrible issues with receivables. Um, UNICEF, by its charter, can't borrow any money, and it takes that to an incredibly serious, it's an incredibly serious restriction because they're not allowed to enter into long-term contracts. They're not allowed to purchase supplies until they have the cash in hand. And so if you think about what UNICEF does today, they run sort of, they delivered more than half the world's vaccines last year. So imagine running one of the most intractable global supply chains with no working capital um, and no easy way to get working capital. And so we worked with UNICEF to basically set up what is a very elaborate working capital facility that's not debt. So it's essentially a private equity working capital facility. Um, and we never would have had that relationship, I think, without having had our foundation colleagues and having had some direct relationships with the senior management and UNICEF in another context. Um, and through that fund, UNICEF's been able to actually significantly expedite the delivery of things like food to starving children, vaccines ahead of the rainy season, and most recently they're using that as part of the polio eradication campaign. So um, polio in the wild is now down to about four countries, and there's sort of a targeted initiative by Rotary International, the Gates Foundation, and others to sort of fund the final eradication of polio. Um, however, the way those grants work is that only 50% is paid up front and 50% is paid down the road. And when you're talking about a multi-billion dollar campaign to eradicate polio, that absence of working capital is sort of crucial and timing matters and days matter. And so we've been able to work with UNICEF to really expedite their global supply chain. And Dana, you look at, you use both PRIs, meaning investments that are made from the grant budget, as well as MRIs, meaning out of the endowment. Talk, maybe give a couple of quick examples that talk about when it's appropriate to use the PRI vehicle versus MRI. Sure, uh, so for us, it's all about the underwriting. Um, what type of capital is needed and what do we think the return characteristics will look like? Um, appreciating, by the way, I, so I come out of Merrill Lynch and I always laugh at the uh, uh, tongue in cheek at the emphasis on what the returns will be and will it be below or will it, because our public equity market is rarely very good at being very consistent at any given point in time. And so for us, it's about putting bounds around things and doing the best we can. And the way we think about it, so grant to PRI is if there's an underwritable path to repayment and or um, the risk is such that uh, it's, we're taking on more risk than return we think we'll get, then we'll move from a grant to a PRI. From a PRI to an MRI, you know, it's tough. There are times when we ask um, our bond managers, for example, to opine on a deal we're looking at because we entered into it thinking it would be a PRI, but the return characteristics are looking pretty good. And so um, it's really about return characteristics for the risk we're taking, and all is not clear at this point in time, um, but we do the best we can, and the regulation, the regulatory environment requires us to make those judgment calls at the time of origination. So there are times when, um, to our benefit, we've been wrong and gotten an upside return on PRIs that was unexpected, and that's okay in the regulatory environment, provided we booked it the way we thought the return characteristics would go. Um, and similarly, there's a little bit about publicly traded. So if something has an active secondary market, it's unlikely that we would enter into it as a PRI. So um, it's not perfect right now, but it's growing clearer, arguably. <laughs> what's, a, what's a recent example of a PRI that you all have done? Yeah. Just so. Um, we have a really exciting one that's in an active capital raise, if anybody's interested. Um, because the infrastructure for our sector is so poor, uh, we can get publicly traded data for public companies, nonprofits, we can get a fair amount of data. But in the private company and sliding over to the nonprofit space, financial data, financial transparency is very difficult. I'm talking about operating data, not 990 data that actually has very little to do with the organization's finances. 
Um, so we made an investment in a company called Co-op Metrics, which uh, aggregates financial or impact data. Uh, it's wonderfully interoperable, speaks to whatever system is resident in an organization or a small business, pulls that data into a single repository, automatically spreads it into the view we want to see it in. Um, we went into that thinking we would do it with a grant, that um, you know, this is a, a, we joke and call it a 20-year-old startup. <laughs> so uh, Sonal knows the, the business a little bit. Um, we went into it thinking it was a grant, but its, it's legal structure is actually cooperative, mm -hmm. that can and does distribute profits and had a history of doing that. So given that there's the potential to distribute profits, we actually ended up booking it as a PRI. Um, we did a tremendous amount of brain damage trying to figure out how to infuse capital into a cooperative without, um, without really diluting anybody's existing position, because that was not our goal. So we ended up actually structuring um, a non-cumulative, perpetual, preferred equity PRI. Wow. So we're not seeking return of principal ever, but in any given year when the company makes a profit and can pay us 5% and remain profitable, we take it. And that will exist into perpetuity. Um, because, however, there's the potential that a large or for-profit suitor may come along at some point, we also reserve the right to have a kicker, so that if they're acquired by somebody big in public or something, we have the right to exercise um, recapture of our principal and or engage in a stock swap or whatever that deal would look like at the time. So um, started out, we thought it would be a grant, migrated to a PRI, but a PRI with a kicker. You sound like a banker. I like it. <laughs> Recovering. <laughs> and Sunil, maybe I can uh, go back to some of your prior experience, talk a little bit about the work that you did at Google, which was really focused on small business. And that's, that's an area that actually a lot of impact investing has gone to support, because in truth, a lot of the organizations that are supporting social environmental change are new or relatively new. And maybe talk a little bit about what that experience was like and sort of some of the deals that you all would have supported as part of that process. Oh, great. Um, so the Google fund, we created a fund with Omidyar and the Soros Network, Omidyar Network and, the Sor and Soros, uh, to invest in small and medium-sized enterprises in India, and similar, a similar type of deal for East Africa. Uh, so the hardest thing was working through the legal structures in India. So we had to create an entity in Mauritius that could invest in India. We had to have three different boards, one in the US, one in Mauritius, one in India. Um, the challenge wasn't finding the deals. The challenge, as you heard Dana talk about, was just figuring out the finance structure. And what did the structure need to look like for Google to be able to make an investment and to put money in um, and to make investments in those deals in India? And what did the legal structures are that we had to work through? So lesson number one, it's hard and it actually takes a lot more time than everybody thinks it should take. Um, probably took about a year to get the legal structure set up. and. Even though we knew what the deal flow was, it took a year to get the legal structure set up. So that was lesson number one. Two, be very creative with your lawyers because the lawyers are generally told it's not possible to do, especially if you're doing PRIs out of corporations. Um, or this was just even investment dollars, it wasn't even PRI dollars. And we had to actually work with them to figure out how to make that happen and what are the ways to do that. So we had to find creative lawyers. Um, not even within the company, from outside the company to help us think through that. And the Omidyar folks were very helpful. And, and three, the deals, and once we made the investments in the country, exits weren't as easy as we thought they were. So it wasn't that you were just going to IPO yourself out, but in many cases what we found was we did, um, we ended up having to sell out to the management of the company itself, so they bought out our, our, our shares and then they ran the company, but we had to create a strike price at which they would buy at, and once they grew big enough. In other cases, they were acquisitions, and, and larger companies acquired, but we had to work that through deal by deal. There was no easy way to do this in small and medium-sized enterprises in these countries, but there were very exciting opportunities. Everything from uh, low-income schools that were private sector because they were actually delivering better outcomes in education at three dollars a day than the government was able to do in any way shape or form or healthcare companies that were providing better healthcare quality than either government or other private hospitals in India were in fact in some of them 
uh, the middle class or the upper class were actually coming to those hospitals because they were just better, they were better healthcare providers. So the opportunities were there, but the creative financing was clearly required, and I think you hear that from both Amita and Dana on that, to um, a willingness to take a bit of risk in, with your lawyers to work through that because it wasn't so easy to figure that out. And even in the United States, when you do investments, you'll find that PRIs for corporations are hard to do. Um, and many times it's because the lawyers don't know what PRIs are. And if you look at the tax legislation, you find that the examples are from 1970 and 1980, and we're sitting in 2014. So uh, the, the legal structures haven't yet kept up with, and the, and the regulatory structures haven't kept up with where we are today in, in being able to do that. And then, and then finally, just the exits were, we had to be creative on exits because it's not your traditional market. Yeah, for sure. And I think those these themes or challenges would be common if you pulled a lot of impact investors. So I want to turn it, think about you all and, and the questions that you may have. It looks like everyone's consumed coffee and snacks, so you should be ready. <laughs> um, so think about that. I just want to ask one last question because we've talked about impact and measurement and accountability um, and a number of the different answers here. And it would just be good to hear just quickly from everyone sort of how do you think of, or how do you approach assessing whether or not you've been successful as it relates to impact? for each of your organizations. And I'll let whoever feels brave go first rather than <laughs> singling you out. I'm happy. <laughs> uh, we're starting with uh, intent and really making sure that the intent of the impact that we want is clearly stated up front. We're coming at this backwards, so it wasn't like where we were. We're now thinking about this more intentionally. Mm -hmm. Even for us, Steve and Jean Case look at this differently. So they were very, very early investors in Zipcar. Yeah. And in Steve Case's mind, Zipcar is not an impact investment. In Gene Case's mind, it is an impact investment. And one could argue, if you were just looking at it, it's an impact investment because it's, it's investing in green, you're investing in the shared economy. But in Steve's world, it's not, he didn't go in with the intent of impact. And that was important to think about because you don't want to whitewash out the impact piece. So we start with intent. What is it we're trying to have impact on early on and make sure we're measuring against it as we go in. And, and even if it's not the perfect metrics of impact, but being clear what we're trying to measure to on the social impact side as well as the financial metrics piece. Great. Let me. So I think for us, what we've tried to do, I think, is, is recognize there's no one perfect set of impact metrics for everything you could possibly do. And so what's helped us, I think, is we've divided the types of investments we make between sort of financial institutions, so community banks, microfinance, things that are getting capital to places they normally wouldn't be, real assets, that's buildings, schools, hospitals, physical infrastructure, um, and then sort of what we think of as social purpose businesses. But businesses in air quotes because it can also include nonprofits with revenue models. And looking at the world through those three separate lenses, we find a, a fairly credible way of, of setting up pretty good metrics. Um, and I think, you know, particularly on the business end, there's a lot of metrics we use from things like B Corp and B Lab. Um, but even in the corporate kind of supply chain and purchasing, there's a lot of good metrics and thinking around how do you look at your supply chain. So we find the business sector actually to be probably the farthest along and having some pretty good metrics, and then the real assets sort of are what they are. You can say, you know, this was built here and did this. Um, evaluating some of the more transformative stuff, either the financial institutions or some of the zip card, mm -hmm. is one of the muddiest. And I think will be muddy, but I think we can live with that muddiness. Um, so I would say for us, it's also a little bit about intent, both ours and where we have the opportunity to engage with management theirs. Um, it is by far our preference to ask an enterprise what they're managing to and what their milestones are for whether or not they think they're successful or getting there or making progress. And nine times out of 10, we will focus on those, um, maybe work to refine them a little bit mm -hmm. or to gain some additional clarity. But um, we also end up managing, part of the reason for co-op metrics is a data aggregator. Mm -hmm. We end up managing different metrics for virtually everybody with the exception of financial metrics, revenue mm -hmm. and things like that. On the impact side, um, because we, we allow management, really, the agency to decide those, um, it's a hodgepodge. Yeah. And it doesn't roll up neatly to say, you know, as a foundation, we were able to contribute to this outcome. Um, we're a long way from that. Yeah, I think it's fair to say this is probably largely a work in progress for most organizations, but uh, you, tr you learn by doing, so that's what we're all working on. So let me uh, turn it to you all for questions. I know there's one eager one back here, and then we'll let the others go. Um, and, and, if, you, can you, and can you say where you're from and your name as well? Uh, Nora Freeland, Old Sky Capital. Um, Amy, in um, September, you um, launched the Global Healthcare Fund. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, number one, how is that, sorry. 
Um, in September, you launched your global health care fund. So two questions. One, how is that going? And number two, for corporate foundations, um, which don't believe or don't have the infrastructure or DNA to be a direct impact investor, do you think a fund, an impact fund model um, can unlock some of their resources um, to be managed by an organization like J.P. Morgan Chase? Sure. So uh, that, that's right. So we launched a, what was called the Global Health Investment Fund last September. This is a collaboration between our organization, between social finance actually specifically, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it was a fund focused on supporting disease or treatments and drugs that would address diseases to, disproportionate to the, that impact the developing world disproportionately. Uh, so malaria, tuberculosis, polio, and some of the others. And we uh, launched that with, with Bill Gates and Jamie Dimon last fall. We've closed at $108 million, so that's now outputting capital to work. We're actually pretty close on our first couple of deals, so stay tuned, but you should probably see, be seeing announcements in the next month or so, so we're really excited about that. Um, and I think to your, the second part of your question, I think there are some opportunities. I actually would give the, um, the Global Health Fund as an example. We had three pharmaceutical companies that participate in that fund. And what was interesting about their participation is that organizationally, it came from different places in all three. In some cases, they viewed this as um, R&D and just part of that budget. In other cases, they thought this is emerging markets growth that we need to be you know, tapping into. And this is an interesting way for us to do that without um, allocating some of our other resources. And in, in one case, it was out of their foundation. And that was actually their first PRI or impact investment was from that foundation in that way. So I think um, non-financial corporates who don't have the infrastructure, I think there is an opportunity in looking at funds, and which is actually the strategy that we've pursued as a way to get to um, both sectors and geographies that are important to you from a business perspective. So, other questions? Go ahead. And there's a mic coming yeah. right behind you as well. Excuse me. Uh, Tia Lindell, State Farm. So, I'm curious, as a company that's participating in the social investing, um, and of course there's probably some default risk, what happens when a not-for-profit does default does the company, and I'm, I'm kind of looking at you, Amit, um, <laughs> does the company, because you've done it for kind of the PR reasons, just write it off? Do they go collect? Do you, ha I mean, can you kind of yeah. speak to that? That's, it's a great question, actually, a, a very sort of astute one. Uh, what we've tried to do is, when we invest in organizations that say have high reputational sensitivity, is find ways to invest that don't directly threaten the mission if we have to foreclose. So rather than sort of just doing a, a loan to the organization, we'll try to find you know, things that can secure it, um, so, or receivables, or something else that's sort of more concrete rather than some of the things we might do for a pure for-profit business. But it's, it's a great question. Yeah. Have you dealt with that, Dana? <laughs> I don't think you can be in this business and not have dealt with workouts. <laughs> um, so we tend to be um, a balance sheet underwriter, so we take recourse to the balance sheet. And uh, I would say, as a theme, it's a case-by-case -case basis. However, it's always our intent to pursue remedies. I mean, that's we entered into a business engagement. We diligenced it as such. We treated it as such during the process. And so we're, we're very mindful and try to design covenants. Um, since we are a philanthropy, we try to design covenants and monitor investments so that if things appear to be going sideways, there's time or moments to intervene, um, if only to say, you know, why are we off in a ditch and can money help bring it back in, either through technical assistance or some other sort of remedy. So there's lots and lots of work that gets done before you hit workout, but, um, you know, racing down to the courthouse steps to perfect a lien is, is something we've done. <laughs> what other questions do we have from the audience? Go ahead. Can you talk a little about the, your infrastructure or how many people that you have? What's, I mean, Not what's enough. The no. Yeah. <laughs> what's, the ideal, what's the ideal model? You, you talked about, Amit, about having, uh, thanks, Rachel Ibarra, at and You talked about having uh, all of it under one umbrella. The three three elements: volunteerism and um, CSR and, and investments. So I'm just curious, what's your infrastructure for both of your organizations? What does that look like, and, and what's really the ideal? Yeah. 
terms of skill sets, competencies, things like that. So I would definitely echo the, the more would be better, but we have um, eight people dedicated to the investment side of our operation, and that's to manage about $500 million. Um, it, it's sort of, it's misleading to some extent because I think it, it sort of matters how many investments you do. Um, investments don't get harder or more time consuming with size, it's probably the opposite actually. The bigger they are, the easier they are. Um, so part of it I think is, it comes down to sort of how you want to do this. If you want to do lots of small dollar loans to small startup enterprises, you'd need more bodies. If you wanted to sort of invest through funds like JP Morgan and sort of pick a portfolio, you could actually get away with far less. So I think it, it comes down to a little bit how you sort of, what, what feels like the right fit for your organization. Um, so for the last five years or so, uh, we have a single infrastructure. We don't have program people and investment people. We have Heron. <laughs> and so every single one of us is tax, uh, tasked with maximizing return and social impact. And so that's very different than most other private foundations. We think it's the most advantageous way because then everybody's eye is on the prize at all times. Um, but fully loaded, uh, including our admin staff, we're at 13. Um, people are busy and running fast and uh, absolutely concur that there are times and there are market segments where we'll use um, a fund manager. So venture capital, we tend to use fund managers, mission aligned fund managers. Private equity, we tend to use mission aligned fund managers, but we always reserve the right to do direct private equity as well. So um, you, you do pick and choose your battles based on your capacity and staffing. What other questions? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Alika Bani from Ted and Suisse. Yeah, having followed in fact investing since 2004 when I was at the Ackerman Fund, uh, just curious to know in terms of besides financial capital, what other aspects are you bringing to these organizations? Talent, you know, we always talk about skills based here. Um, so, you know, how do you, one of the obstacles we find in, in making the exits happen is how do you get to that level where you can have an exit? Yeah. That, I, I just have to laugh because I always say, um, depending on which of my board members you're speaking to, there's either six, seven, or 11 forms of capital <laughs> at our disposal. So our board is very clear that money is but one form of capital, and, and we actually track and report things like reputational capital, social capital, have we leveraged a relationship we have in service to an investment. And I don't know if Daryl's still in the room, but I was chasing him around earlier today because we have a direct private equity investment who learned that we knew him and they want him on their board. So they're like, talk to Daryl. So that, that's the type of thing we'll do in service um, to our investment. So if you can imagine it, we will leverage it. Try. I think similar, one of the things that we've done that I think we're very proud of is we have a uh, board service program. And that board service program sort of places high potential uh, employees, particularly sort of with a lens towards diversity on boards of nonprofits, but we also sort of will put it on some of the boards of our more sort of mission-oriented for-profit investments. And so we've been able to sort of leverage our board service programs. Uh, we're trying to do a little bit with the kind of skills-based and pro bono. I think that's so far proven to be a little bit more tricky, but I think there's no reason we won't be able to solve that also. And I would just add, so we, we're a six-person team at JP Morgan Chase, but when we talk to our investees, our fund managers, we always tell them in getting an investment from JP Morgan, you're not just getting capital, you're also getting access to the other 260,000 people and the expertise that comes along with it. So you have access to our platform. So for example, that's often met, um, you know, if they need some sort of contact or networking within the geography or sectors that they need expertise, we can bring that to the table. Um, we've leveraged our research desk to do some of that work. Uh, we actually had one of our investees who was looking at a company in India, and it turns out someone in our organization was also looking at investing in it, and so they partnered together. And so there's some nice synergies in terms of, you know, we have a huge organization, we have an incredible talent, um, that should be something that we can provide as a service to help these businesses be successful and as a condition as well to any of our investees coming on board, they have to uh, be willing to have a fairly interactive dialogue with me and the rest of the team, meaning you know, we want to be constructive and be partners and we're going to stay on top of you and we hope that ends up being a beneficial thing for them in the long run. I'll just add, I think it depends on how big or small the investment is um, mm -hmm. or the size of the investment. So if you're looking at smaller companies, it's a lot more work. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to offer mentorship, you're going to offer board members. You're going to offer them an opportunity to figure out what business model they need to create because a lot of these 
are new types of businesses. So if you look at alternative energy investment in Kenya or Tanzania or Uganda, and it's small, you know, generators, and you're going to work with small. You're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out the business models. So if you look at somebody like the Shell Foundation, they've spent 10 years trying to figure out those business models and how they're going to work because they've had to play around with different types of capital and the. The companies themselves get a lot of a tutoring as a part of that. The part that I think most people don't spend enough time and money on is actually providing training to people in those businesses. It is uh, human capital is the single greatest challenge with impact investing, and very few companies or very few investors think about training the human capital in that space because um, they're new investor, they're new, they're trying to figure it out, they have a passion, but they don't really know how to run a business. Um, these are things that take some time and energy to do, and if, if, if there's a place to put some capital where it could actually go a really long way, it makes a ton of difference to have the human capital. So we probably have time for one more question, if someone wants it. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Kathleen Rubin with AT&T. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about reporting of these investments. Um, I know you mentioned offering things like mentorism, and I know sometimes we can include um, the value of an employee's time sort of as volunteerism. Um, so I wanted to hear your perspective on, on reporting in that way, and also how you kind of distinguish between below market rate, at market rate, where are you kind of draw those lines when, when you talk about these investments. Anyone want to start? Um, so <clears throat> I, I tend to be of the mind that the distinctions are sort of artificially precise. I think there's stuff that is credit worthy or close to credit worthy, and that's one bucket of the world, and then there's stuff that's just not. Um, and we live in a world where all interest rates for all credit or credit worthy stuff is low, so I think mm -hmm. A lot of those conversations, I think, are unnecessarily precise. I think there's stuff that's generally investable, and then there's stuff that is worth doing, but you might as well be flipping a coin. Um, and so that's at least how we've sort of divided the world into those sort of two buckets. Yeah, I would say for us, um, we do get a little more into the weeds. Uh, yeah. You know, if there's no path to repayment or no underwritable path to repayment, we'll use a grant. If there's a path to repayment, we'll look at a PRI. And then we really do start focusing. We're a risk-based pricer in our PRIs, meaning um, whereas the Ford Foundation kind of is the hallmark example, every PRI is 10-year, 1% money, we're not that way. We're a risk-based pricer. So we are regularly looking at what is the market rate sector for that investment generating, what do we think this will generate. And we do make those comparisons, and occasionally there are difficult calls. So um, we document a lot. We seek third-party opinions. We often ask regular, quote unquote, investment funds, if you looked at this investment, would you invest and uh, take a fair amount from their feedback? So for us, it's a little blurrier, but, but agreed, at least broadly, there's underwritable uh, and then there's sort of not, and that's your first cut. And I'll just add that when we surveyed sort of the market on this majority, so a little more than half of the investors we talked to thought or sort of held themselves out as pursuing market rate of returns. And then it was about evenly split from there between people who thought they were either doing completely concessionary capital preservation and people who thought they were doing something in between. I think the interesting follow-on question to that particular question is, what is market? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Which is kind of what these guys are talking about. And, and the truth is, is that with the, with the rates environment changing as much as it has over the last several years, it's actually very difficult. And then add that to the fact that a lot of where what impact investing is focused on is actually targeting brand new interventions or filling gaps that weren't being filled prior. There really isn't a market. And so this is a, this is a bit of a struggle, but I think it comes down to sort of the spirit of what you're trying to do in ter from a capital perspective and sort of what benchmarks you may be using internally. Uh, we often think about more internal benchmarks than we do about external ones and sort of what's, what's the opportunity cost of the capital that I'm using. Um, and reporting-wise, and it's probably true for everyone else, um, we present quarterly reports that talk about the financial returns and talk about the impact. And we talk about our objective has been to improve livelihoods for low-income and underserved populations. So we talk about the reach of our investment, but also the mode of intervention. How do we know that lives are actually being improved through the companies that we're supporting? Um, and that's, that's really important to our team, but also important to our overall mandate within the firm that we talk about both of those things. And I just... Um 
on the part about the rates, and I agree with uh, what, what is below market and what's not, I think to some extent the impact investing field has faced a slight bit of challenge, which is people are looking for 20% rate of returns or assume there's some 20% rate of return in equity and private equity or venture capital type thing. Well, first of all, neither venture capital nor private equity are returning that. <laughs> so we're holding impact investments here when right. even the funds themselves are not meeting, the market itself is not meeting that. And frankly, we're talking about you know treasuries at 3%. Right. So if you beat the market, you beat it at past 3%. So 5%, 7% returns are not bad returns in today's market. But I think the, the, the way we've PR'd this is frankly ridiculous in the impact investing space. So just keep that in mind because I don't think there's a benchmarking and thinking through that. What, what are you benchmarking to? And I agree yeah. with, with Amy's point on that. On, on the, I'm going to take a slightly more controversial point on the reporting internally within companies. I think we spend a lot of time reporting number of hours spent doing service or doing all that other stuff. Frankly, we report nothing on outcomes. And we cannot go another 20 years saying we're doing all this great stuff and we still have 50% high school dropout rates in the United States. Like, it just seems a little ridiculous that we don't hold ourselves to a higher standard than the fact that we feel better as companies or as a government saying this stuff and not getting to the outcomes that we need to get to. So I would push and say it would be great to see companies starting to say we're going to aggregate and say if these five companies are working in Newark that they're going to reduce the rate of the high school dropout rates by 20% the next 15 years and hold ourselves accountable to that versus how many of our employees spent you know, how many hours serving. We did this at Goldman when I was at Google, it was the same thing. It didn't matter, those hours didn't matter. Yes, people feel, felt better about it, but at the end of the day, if we're talking about community service, let's, let's get to the outcomes on community. And let's not spend any more hours thinking about how many more hours we can serve and how many more people. And I'll give you one example. You look at Washington, D.C. There are probably 300 organizations that do education-related impact stuff in Washington, D.C. at the high school dropout rate hasn't changed in 25 years. Mm -hmm. So who cares that we're investing in 50 or 350 great organizations if the rate hasn't changed? Mm -hmm. So collectively, it's not making a difference. So we have to hold ourselves higher to the higher rate of, to a higher metric of success than what we do right now. So the conference gods have smiled on us and given us a little bit more time. <laughs> so if there are other questions, um, I'm curious to hear from you all as well in terms of what is helpful. I and mean, we've talked a little bit about you know, all the different organizations represented have been doing this for various amounts of time, but I know a lot of you all are thinking about it or are here because you're interested in it. Maybe there are some things that we can talk about about how this all gets started, but where are there other questions in the audience on this topic? So I'm Brian Grill from Merck, so I'm familiar with the Global Health Innovation Fund. Excellent. Um, Thank you for your investment. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so I, I have responsibility for the Merck Foundation, our philanthropy function, and and it was interesting when we started having conversations with with you all about investing in this fund. You know, we we struggled with figuring out where should we fund it from in the company. Should it be an investment from the foundation? Should it be an investment from another part of the company? And we ultimately decided not to have that investment come out of the foundation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, as, as all of you are engaged in this type of work and you're approaching potential corporate funders, you know, how is it that you, well, are you seeing trends? Are you seeing trends in where that funding is coming from? And what guidance are you providing to these corporate funders around kind of what the value proposition is for them and how that fits into their broader CSR framework? Yeah. I, um... So I would say the majority of the time where I see corporates, it's in our work around growing, um, disaggregating supply chains, typically of anchor institutions domestically, and really working to grow the ability of small and minority business enterprises to play in those supply chains. So we see lots of corporates show up there in terms of their enlightened self-interest, which is perfectly and entirely acceptable from our point of view. And so I think um, th the majority of the way that ends up working out is we're there as, as a philanthropic investor who's often providing alongside the corporates in some cases and, and not in others, technical assistance to the businesses to make sure they have what they need to be able to play in rather rigorous supply channels. Um, we're often 
you know, taking small businesses who have a bookkeeper and moving them up towards CFO or similar, and then the corporates often come back in at the layering of capital. You know, from our perspective, we're interested in job creation in this country, and yet small and minority businesses often can't play in structured supply channels because they don't have the working capital to get the contract. Well, they can't get the contract without the working capital. So philanthropy, we tend to step in and create structured funds, often where the corporates are joining us as um, either a subordinate lender or a grant maker who provides um, first loss layer inside a fund. We lever it up with PRI capital on top of that and then traditional capital there. Uh, and eventually, as those businesses grow, we're taken out by traditional banks and that's wonderful. That's a victory. Um, so for me, that's where the majority of the time um, we're seeing corporates play uh, beyond pure philanthropy. Pure philanthropy shows up in other places, but for us, it's, it's getting really interesting and creative, and I spend a lot of time and can talk to you forever about this particular piece of our business, but that's where we see it. I say we've seen it more, so there are certainly examples of uh, non financial corporates are sort of a different animal in and of yeah. themselves, but non financials, I, I don't see it as frequently coming out of the foundation. I see it more coming out of, and this is where going back to, we ta started talking a little bit, and me and I both highlighted how spon senior sponsorship has been really essential to our mandates. And it comes, part of the reason social finance was started in the investment bank wasn't necessarily because we thought investment banking was the right home for social finance. It's proved to be a very good home for it. Um, but it was in part because there was really strong sponsorship because there was management within the organization who thought this is something we need to be doing. It's really important to our international growth strategy. It's really important to the client conversations that we're having with institutional investors who are thinking about values and impact and wanting to incorporate that into strategies. Um, it's great branding. Like there are just a lot of reasons why it made business sense. Um, in addition to being something that had a nice story and sort of PR element to it that we could certainly take advantage of. And I think that has been true sort of a, more or less from most of the corporates that we've seen outside of the financial industry, um, not surprisingly. And I would say, and they're sort of participating in different ways. A lot, um, we see a lot of other institutional investors who are taking approach similar to us where they've effectively ring-fenced a certain amount of capital and are saying, here's $100 million, here's $200 million, we're gonna invest it, and this is the mandate wrapped around it. We're maybe taking a bit of a flexible approach um, or we're willing to take a little bit, slight, something slightly concessionary from a return perspective because we see some other intangibles are deriving from this business. Um, we've seen others who've invested through funds. We were talking about that a little bit earlier. Um, we've, uh, we've seen, for example, uh, Omid and I are both in a fund called Leapfrog, which is focused on insurance in the emerging markets. And there's a number of insurers, reinsurers, and other strategics who have participated in that. Um, because they think this is a way for them to understand an emerging markets population that is huge growth for them, but don't know yet know how to tackle it. So let LeapFrog do the dirty hard work, <laughs> and then they can come in and be part of the fund and also co-invest where it's appropriate and potentially provide exit opportunities. So I feel like that tends to be more the strategy for the corporates um, that we've seen as well. Yeah. I, I'd only just add that I, I think it struck me as two ships passing in the night. I think you know the corporates. You know we spend a lot of time talking about impact investing and getting high net worth individuals or getting retail individuals. You know there's tremendous cash on corporate balance sheets, and and so I think you know we as, as sort of the investment universe hasn't done a, haven't, hasn't done a very good job of reaching out to the corporates. I think Amy's product accepted is one of the few really good examples of leveraging corporates. Uh, on the flip side, I think as corporates are looking at lots of you know their supply chain issues differently or, or various other parts of sort of their delivery mechanisms there is a lot of investing infrastructure that's been created in the impact universe and unlike you know many asset classes where 100 million dollars is a small drip in some giant mutual fund 50 or 100 million dollars you will get a fund manager to custom design just about anything you want to do just about anything in the impact space and so i think maybe you know without reinventing the wheel internally i actually think you'd be shocked at the level of customization you can get in the marketplace because it's so small. Yeah. Any other burning questions from the audience? So maybe just to close them, maybe if I could ask any of you if you, if you, if you could wave a magic wand, what's sort of your biggest wish for this marketplace and maybe thinking about corporates in particular, what, what's something that you'd like barrier, you'd like to see eliminated or element change to sort of make that happen? 
Um, I, 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 I think there's this really interesting opportunity on the issues of sourcing and small businesses to, to have some convergence, and particularly, I think, to move away from what I would describe as sort of identity-based sourcing, which is you know, small racial minority and more to sort of performance-based sourcing. So what are your labor practices? What are your environmental practices? And I think there's thinking on both ends that can be brought together, but, but looking at that kind of high road sourcing and how do you actually improve the behavior of your suppliers as opposed to just sort of their you know, composition. I'd say don't, um, don't under, uh, underestimate, and to your point about Merck as a corporate investor, don't underestimate investing even within like the communities that you tend to live in. So I used to work in the government, and Dow and many other companies would invest in the cities that they were in, and that was part of their impact investment, and there are ways and there's lots of things to do there. I wouldn't underestimate the value of that, and I think we don't talk enough about it from the world that yeah. we live in. We think about it from the broad impact investing, which funds are we investing in, but communities have needs, and communities have investment needs. Don't underestimate the value of what you could do in your community investment needs and where the opportunities are, um, whether it's city investment funds or other types of places where there's huge opportunities, including through the, through the sourcing of, uh, through supply chains, it can make a huge difference. And, and if I could you know, add one final thing, I would say what would be great is to think about how you all might partner with others that are already in the space to customize, because um, the demand for customization is huge. There is no, there's no plan that tells you if you just put your money into that, that would work. There is no grand scheme yet, and there's no uh, trends that are really great trends are being created. So if you could take some of the risk in terms of helping with those trends, it would go a long way. And I would just say materiality, that as, as corporates are embracing impact and that things we all do, our trade lines have a way of being in the world that has impact on communities. I think the more we recognize that those actually are not externalities, they're material yeah. to the valuation of an enterprise and the performance of that enterprise over time, let's start reporting those so that we as impact investors, all of us can make better decisions. Well, I hope you all will join me in thanking all of our panelists for the conversation. Thank you.